once you have a risk balance assumption that's going to support a lot of motion planning, then there is this question about do you have realistic distribution for that? And do you have a realistic dynamics, right? So planning what we used to do with the building on linear, but then when you do with nonlinear convex, then that makes this value a lot harder. If you want to deal with the distribution with our instructions galaxy, right, then that becomes challenging as well. So Thank you. So as Brian said, this last talk is on risk bounded motion planning. And I want to start with this question that what is risk? How do you define risk in, in planning? Any thoughts? Right. So in short, risk is defined as chance of failure in plan. So why do we need to care about chance of failure in motion planning? On Tuesday, you saw a set of nice tools for motion planning. Using these motion planning algorithms, you can make robots run, fly, swim. You can launch the spaceship. You can even make them to do a backflip. So if you have such powerful Techniques, why do we need to look for risk bounded version? Okay, this is one answer, but not the right. Safety. Safety. Yes. The main uh, problem is the safety. So most of these techniques has a big assumptions. They assume that we know the state of the world, but asking for a state of the world is too much. We have too many sources of uncertainty. We have sensing disturbances when we are localizing the robot and obstacle. We have control noises, for example, the wind disturbances for drones. We have unknown, rough, uncertain trains for walking robots. So simply, we do a trajectory optimization to drive a robot from a given state for a, a stable pose, for example, for a stable pose for an Atlas robot or a stable pose for a spaceship. But because of uncertainty, robots deviates and ends up in an unstable pose and fails. And even if we have a precise sensors, even if we know, if we have prior knowledge about the environment, the intention of the other players are also uncertain. For example, when we are driving, the, answer, uh, the decision of the other drivers are uncertain to us. So to, to deal with uncertainty, we are going to use risk-bounded motion planning algorithms in this talk. But before we do this, so we want to know what are other options to deal with uncertainty. In general, we have two set of options, robust techniques and risk-bounded techniques. In robust techniques, if we are doing planning under uncertainty, the obtained plan should be valid for all possible values of uncertainty. Let's see how it works. Consider this a uh, simple motion planning scenario. We want to drive robot from a start position to a goal region we have a turtle bot that plays a role of a fixed obstacle. So we don't have any uncertainty. So we can call uh, many different motion planning algorithms like RRT star, PRM, or trajectory optimization. Construct our path to the goal. Now consider next scenario. This time, turtle bot plays a role of moving obstacle and its location is uncertain. We only know that the obstacle moves between these two given points. Now, if we, if we want to use robust techniques to construct a pass, what should be the pass look like? How should we construct the pass? So from robust approach, the obtained pass should work for all possible of uncertainties, where here is the location of the turtle bot. So it means that we are allowed it only to use the left side of the room to construct a pass. Right now, 
uh, no matter how this obstacle moves, we are always safe. So what is wrong with this kind of reasoning? This robust reasoning. Uh, no, we don't have uh, all information about the moving obstacle. We only know the range of uncertainty. It is, yes, it could be. Pardon? Um, no. So let's look at the next scenario. This time, the obstacle moves from the, that side of the room to this side. Right now, the problem is invisible. There is no past that is valid for all possible values of uncertainties. No matter how we construct the past, we can find the location for the obstacle that collides with our past. So from robust techniques point of view, this problem is infeasible, right? Even if we replace the turtle butt with a real turtle that takes 10 days to travel from that side to this side, this problem is infeasible. There is no path, so too conservative. So in general, robust techniques result in too conservative because we want the plan work for all possible scenarios of the uncertainties. Or in other words, we want to plan for worst case scenario. So what is this worst case scenario? For example, assume that we're, we are driving. Should we assume that all other uh, drivers are drunk and, con and distracted by their phones? Planning for this situation will result in too conservative and poor plan. So this is where risk-bounded approaches step in and suggest that, okay, let's not only look at the uncertainty set, but also the frequency of the each values of the uncertainty. How frequent is to see obstacle in this side of the room? Freq frequency of the uncertainty means probability distribution of the uncertainty. So if we look at the probability distribution and if we get lucky, we will see that there is a a small chance that we observe robot in this part of the room. So we can use this space and construct the past, the goal. But since still there's a non, uh, there is a non-zero chance of observing obstacles, there's a non-zero chance of collision. So there's a non-zero chance of failure for this plan. In this talk, we are going to look at tools to minimize this chance of failure or we bound this chance of fa failure by given predefined value delta that we call it risk bound. So in summary, if I want to compare the risk bound approach and robust, it is all about probability versus possibility. In possibility, in robust, we only have two outcomes, failure or success, zero or one, just two outcomes, but on the other hand, Risk-bounded versions offers us zero, one, and whatever is between. Not only we can fail or success, we can also decide the degree of this failure and the success. So we have more freedom, and this freedom will result in less conservative plans. Okay. Any questions so far? And if you have any questions, please let me know during the talk. So now we know why do we need responded approaches. Now let's come up with a nice mathematical formulation. So in risk bounded motion plannings, we assume that first we are given a continuous state space model for a robot. In this model, x represent a vector of states. For example, this vector could uh, represent position and velocity of a vehicle or joint angles and angular velocity for a manipulator or a walking robot. And since we have uncertainty, I model uncertainty with the omega with some known probability distribution. Given this dynamic and given the current state and the current control input, we can find the states for the next time step. Next, 
We are given an unsafe region in the state space that I call an obstacle. This region is described by a set of inequalities. For example, if these inequalities are described by linear constraints, we are going to see some convex polytop in, com in state space, and I where each edge is described by, by one of these linear inequalities. Or if we, or these inequalities are described by polynomials, where we can, in general, describe more complex and non-convex region. For example, that non-convex region is described by one polynomial inequality. So given uncertain dynamical system and given obstacles, risk at time k is defined as this probability, probability that the state of system at time k collide with obstacle. Now, in risk-bounded motion planning, we are looking for sequence of the control inputs such that we drive a robot to a goal region with respect to this chance probabilistic constraints. We want to bound the probability of collision with obstacle by given delta k risk bound. Or equivalently, we want to make sure that probability of the success, probability of remaining in safe region is greater than one minus delta k. We know how to deal with deterministic constraints. But here we want to see how we can actually evaluate this probabilistic constraints. To evaluate this probabilistic constraint, we have to go through two steps. First step is uncertainty propagation, and the next one is probability calculation. Let's see how uncertainty propagation works. So we are given nonlinear dynamics that describes the position of the airplane, and we are also given a control input the control input is the velocity and the yaw angle of the airplane. Using this control input, we can drive the plane to a goal region avoiding the obstacle. Now assume that we have uncertainty, wind disturbances, control noises. I model them with the omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3 and 4. They have some probability distribution. Now, because of this uh, uncertainty, plane will deviate from the given nominal trajectory. If we repeat this experiment over and over, we will see these trajectories for plane, the trajectories that are disturbed by the uncertainties. If we look at these trajectories at discrete times, we are going to see such patterns. These patterns show the possible locations for the airplane at each discrete time. These patterns are different realization of a random variable. So we can use numerical approach and come up with the probability distribution associated for these samples. So it means that since we have a probabilistic uncertainty at each time k, states of the system are also random variable and has some probability distribution. And to evaluate this probabilistic constraint, we have to find this probability distribution. But in general, we don't have any closed form solution to describe this distribution except for particular cases. For example, consider this case. Here, this is a plane scenario. I uh, redefine the input so that we can get a linear dynamics. Right now, the input is velocity in x and y direction. I, I, I assume that uncertainties are Gaussian. In this case, this is how the uncertainty propagates, the uncertain location of the airplane. If we look at these uncertainties, we will observe Gaussian distribution. At each time k, the states of the airplane has a pro Gaussian probability distribution with different mean and different covariance. And we can come up with a closed form formulation to describe this mean and covariance. So in general, if you are given a linear dynamics with Gaussian uncertainty for initial state and also for uncertainties, at each time k, states of the system will have a Gaussian distribution whose mean and covariance are described by these two equations. Based on this, the mean at time k plus one can be described by the mean of the state at, at previous time, input, and the mean of the no, uh, noise. And the covariance at k plus one can be described by the covariance of the states and the noise at time k. So we have a nice formulation 
to propagate the uncertainty when we have a linear dynamics and Gaussian distribution. Now, uh, assume that we are given probability distribution for states, Gaussian or non-Gaussian. In next step, to calculate this probability of failure, from the definition of the probability, we need to find this integral with respect to the given probability distribution over the obstacle region. And this obstacle is in general non-convex and it's non-linear and complex. So we don't have any closed form solution in general to find this integral. And this requires a multivariate integral techniques. But if we assume that the given distribution is Gaussian and the obstacle is defined by linear inequalities, we can come up with a closed form solution for this probability. Since the summation of Gaussian distribution is also a Gaussian distribution, we can define a new variable zy based on the linear constraint. And then we can uh, find its mean and covariance based on the mean and covariance of the state. By doing so, instead of evaluating this multivariate probability, I can evaluate this univariate probability based on z1. And since it's a Gaussian, I can write its probability based on this, the CDF, CDFL of the standard normal distribution. To find this probability, I just need to find that value, b minus mean of the z divided by covariance, and then I need to look for the CDF and get the probability. So we have a closed form solution to calculate the probability when we have a linear constraint and Gaussian distribution. So in summary, to be able to evaluate the chance constraints, we have to go through uncertainty propagation and uh, probability calculation steps. And in risk-bounded planning, we are trying to find control sequence such that to control, to shape this probability distribution such that the overlap of this distribution and obstacles that defines our chance of failure, chance of collision, such that this failure becomes less than our risk bounds. To do this, uh, I'm going to look at several approaches. The first, in first set of approaches, I will assume that we have a Gaussian linear system with linear obstacles since we know how to propagate uncertainty. And in the next set of approaches, we will look at more general cases with nonlinear dynamics and arbitrary distribution. So let's look at the first set. In the first approaches, I'm going to come up with a risk-bounded version of trajectory optimization, RRT star, and PRM, three popular motion planning algorithms. So let's first start with chance constraint trajectory optimization. We know how to solve deterministic tra trajectory optimization problem. You saw this on uh, Tuesday. So in deterministic case, we are given an initial state for robot, and we are looking for a sequence of the control to minimize a cost function that usually represents energy function. With respect to dynamical constraint, and hard constraint on safety and constraint on the final state. In the chance constraint version, we are given the initial distribution for state and distributions for uncertainty, and we are looking for a sequence of the control to minimize the expected value of the cost function with respect to dynamical constraints and probabilistic constraints on safety and expected value constraints for the last state. And since we assume that everything is linear, we have a linear dynamics, Gaussian distribution, linear obstacles, so we need to solve that linear stochastic optimization. Now, the main idea is to replace that probabilistic constraint with linear deterministic constraints in terms of the mean and the covariance of the distributions. And we know how to propagate and get those mean and covariance. So by doing so, we are going to get a deterministic linear optimization and we know how to solve it efficiently. For this, so we saw that if we have a univariate Gaussian random variable, 
we can describe the probability in terms of the CDF. Now, if we are given a chance constraint in terms of the univariate Z and a linear constraint, to satisfy this constraint using that result, the mean and the covariance of the univariate <coughs> random variable should satisfy that linear constraint. So based on this linear constraint, the mean Z bar should be greater than B, that comes from the linear constraint, plus some safety margin C, where the safety margin is described by the covariance and also risk bound. Then using this result, and also by univariate representation of the linear constraint, we can show that to satisfy this given probabilistic constraint in terms of one linear inequality, the mean and the covariance of the state should satisfy this linear constraint. Based on this constraint, the mean of the inequality, the uh, left-hand side, should be greater than B, which comes from the constraints, plus some safety margin C, which that safety margin is described by the covariance of the states and also risk bound. And we know how to find this covariance and the mean. So given this probabilistic constraint, we can come up with this linear deterministic constraint in terms of the mean and covariance. Now assume that we are given a linear obstacle described by a set of linear inequalities. So what is the safety constraints for robot? Assume that everything is deterministic for now. So for safety, robot should stay out of the obstacle or robot should stay in the other side of the each edge. So in this case, robot for this obstacle ha uh, has four options. Robot could be in the other side of the first edge with introduce this linear constraints or Robot could stay on the second region on the other side of the second edge, or robot can stay uh, uh, on the other side of the third and the fourth edge. So this obstacle introduced four disjunctive constraints. Robot has option. It could stay in this region or in that region. Now, since everything is probabilistic, we will going to look at the, the probabilistic version of those linear constraints. So we are going to get disjunctive probabilistic constraints. And from the previous slide, we know how to replace this probabilistic constraint with the deterministic one. We can replace each, each of these constraints with linear deterministic in terms of mean and the covariance of the distributions, plus some safety margins. If we plot these new inequalities, we will see something like this. So this is our original obstacle. The red lines are the new obstacles. It is a new obstacle which its size depends on the safety margin. As safety margin increases, this obstacle will increase. So right now, if the expected value of the distribution, the center of these circles, it stays out of this safety margin, the chance constraints are satisfied. So in trajectory, in chance constant trajectory optimization, chance constraint at each time will introduce a new obstacle and then everything becomes deterministic. We just need to make sure that the expected value stays outside this safety margin. That's simple. As the covariance, this distribution increases, safety margins will increase and we are going to get a larger and larger obstacle. So in short, to solve this trajectory optimization, we need to solve this linear deterministic optimization involving disjunctive constraints. And we can solve this problem efficiently. We can, for example, use big M formulation and reformulate it as a mixed linear integer program, MILP. And we can call, for example, Groovy and solve it efficiently. So before I get uh, to some simulation results, here I assume that at each time k, we know risk bound. There, yeah. Pardon? Groove is a so optimi optimizer that we can solve linear programs and MILP. Uh, linear programs. Yeah, you can call, call it from MATLAB or other softwares. 
so we can efficiently solve the MILF and linear optimizations. Okay, so here I assume that we know delta K, we know the risk at time K, but usually we are given a risk one for a whole mission. We are given delta for a whole mission, and to find the delta Ks, the risk bonds for each time K, one option is to uniformly allocate risk between different time steps by dividing the delta by T, which knows the number of the steps for whole mission. And if we have multiple obstacles, we can again uniformly allocate risk between the obstacle obstacles by dividing the delta K by N, which N is the number of the obstacles. But the other option is to use non-uniform risk allocation. In this case, we assume, we assume that delta ij, risk bound for obstacle i at time j, is unknown. And it's a uh, optimization variable. And optimizers should decide these risk bounds with respect to this kind of thing. The summation of the old risk should be greater than given risk bound. So we are given delta, but the optimization that you saw, so we, need, we needed delta k. We need to find how much risk we want to explain at time k. At, so we, we, we need to get delta k from delta. So if we assume that at each time k we, ha we want to use delta, then if we find a risk for whole mission, it could be a disaster. It could be something large. Any other question? Okay. Yeah, so if at time k there is no obstacle around, I don't need to spend risk, so we can save it for more challenging scenarios. <coughs> Delta. Yeah, we should know the, yeah, the mission length. We assume that we know t. So if you want to work with the fixed delta, then at each time k, and if you want to remain <coughs> uniform, you're going to have a less option to risk. So that's why we like to work with non-uniform case. Uh, what if there are two obstacles close to each other? Uh, the risk bound will overlap. Yes, then they will, we will see in the next scenario, yeah. Okay. Let's cut. So in this scenario, so we want to drive a robot to get to the gold region. <coughs> so the, the solid line shows the obtained path for non-deterministic case, which is optimal, and the shortest path. So when we have uncertainty because of those safety margins around the obstacles, the obtained path tries to get far from the obstacle. And as we increase, as we decrease the risk bound, the obtained path, the, the, blue, the blue one, for example, tries to get farther. So the reason is this, by increasing, by decreasing the risk bound, the safety margin increases, and those safety margins block this area between the obstacles, the weak points. So 
we, can, we are not allowed to take that way. So that's why it decides to take the longer path to get to the destination. So in general, there's a trade-off between optimality and risk. If we want to be optimal, we need more risk. And in similar way, we can add a different constraint. For example, here I have two rover and I want them to meet to go to the gold region. We have several regions to go and visit and take samples, but we don't know the order. Op the optimizer should find the order of the visit. These, uh, each of these locations will add a new disjunctive constraint to the problem. For example, a robot at time k has this option of visiting region one, region two, and so on. So this will add new set of disjunctive constraint, and then in similar way, we can come up with the probabilistic version and solve the problem. So in this problems, uh, the optimizer decide that to meet the chance constraint, the uh, row one should go and first visit region one, three, four, six, and the rest of the regions should be visited by the rover two. So what if we have too many number of obstacles? So each obstacle, each edge of the obstacles introduces one constraint to problem. So if we have a, too many obstacles, we are going to get a large optimization problem. How we can reduce the size So in this case, when we have uh, too many obstacles, instead of working with obstacles directly, instead of uh, writing the safety constraints based on obstacles, we, we can first look for safe regions and construct some connected safe region and then state the safety constraints in terms of the safe region. So here, in similar way, a robot has the option of being in the safe region one, two, three, and this will introduce a disjunct of constraint and then we can come up with the probabilistic version. But instead of dealing with, let's say, 20 obstacles, here we just need to deal with three convex sets. Okay, so the next approach that I'm going to look at, it's a chance constraint RRT star. So we all know that how RRT star works. So we are given initial states, we sample the state space, then we keep the obstacle-free samples, then we drive the robot toward these sample points, then we get to the new state, and then we repeat and go the tree until we get to the goal region. In chance constant version, so we assume that we are given an initial, we, we have a linear dynamics and a controller, a predefined controller with fixed gain, for example, we can obtain it from LQR to drive the robot toward the sample points. So, and we are also given an initial distribution for a node. Then since we have a linear dynamics and linear controller, we can propagate this distribution and find the distribution for each node. And instead of looking for obstacle-free node, we are going to look at risk-bounded nodes. By these equations, we are propagating the Gaussian and then using the disjunctive linear constraint that we discussed, we can immediately calculate the risk of each node and then keep the nodes that satisfies our chance constraint. So at the end, we are going to see a tree like this. We have a different distributions on the nodes. So we need to grow this tree until the expected value of the distributions meets uh, the goal region. So here we are just only looking at the distributions on the nodes. We can also find these distributions over the trajectories while we are traveling to the nodes and calculate the risk of the trajectory, not the final one. So next approach is a risk-bounded PRM. So in PRM, so the whole point of PRM is to construct a graph. So instead of working with trees, we want to construct a graph in offline nodes. We want to find uh, obstacle-free nodes and, and connect the nodes with edges and design a controller in offline mode to 
to travel between the nodes. So we want to do all calculation offline and then in real time everything reduces to the graph search problem if you want to do motion plan. Now assume that we have uncertainty. Robot, robot is a, in the node zero, has a, it has an initial distribution. Robot travels to the node J using two different paths. So depending on the travel path, we are going to see a different distributions for a robot. Is this good or bad? We can get to one point with different distribution. What does it mean? Any thought? I, I can hear you. Yeah, in that sense, it's good, but we wanted, so the whole point of the PRM is the, the graph structure. We want to do the calculation once and then use the results in real time case. But when this happens, it means that although I have a graph in a state space, in the belief space, which is the space of all the distribution, we are going to get a tree. It becomes similar to RRT star. So at each time, if I'm given a distribution, we have to grow a tree, propagate the uncertainties, and repeat the old calculation to find the path. So there is no point to use a PRM if we have uncertainty. Right? Do you see this problem? So we want to construct a graph in belief space, not a tree. If you want to work with tree, we can go back and work RRT star. It is shown that if we enhance the constructed graph by two set of controllers, uh, time varying LQG as a edge controller and also a stationary LQG for the node controllers, we can show that we can send a family of Gaussian distribution to a certain family of Gaussian distribution under this controller. So we can define this family of distribution as a node in my belief space. So these families are going to represent the nodes of the graph in the belief space. So then if robots gets to one node under these controllers, we know that its distribution is part of this family of the distribution in the node. So we don't, need to prob we don't need to repeat the calculation. We don't need to start from the, the zero node and propagate uncertainties and find the, the distribution for current node. We can, in offline mode, find these family of the distributions and construct a graph and then con uh, find the risk, risk of for each edge in offline mode. And then in the real time, everything reduces again to a graph search problem in the belief space. There are also many uh, mathematical details on uh, mainly on the, this convergence. So if you look at the, the firm techniques, you can find more details. So in the first set of tools, we assume that everything is linear. We have a Gaussian distribution. We have linear obstacles. And we come up with the risk bounded version of popular planners, RRT star, PRM, and trajectory optimization techniques. Right now, we are going to look at, look at more uh, general cases where we have nonlinear dynamics and arbitrary distribution. Let's first look at the arbitrary uncertainties. One option to deal with uncertainty, this arbitrary uncertainty. In the Gaussian case, so we saw that so if distribution are uh, uh, Gaussian, we can replace that probabilistic constraint with a linear constraint based on mean and covariance. If we have non-Gaussian distribution, means that the states of the system are going to have a different distributions. I'm going to use results from distributionally robust techniques. So based on these results, given a linear chance constraint, if the mean and covariance of any distribution, not only Gaussian, any distribution satisfies this linear constraint, 
then we can satisfy the chance constraint. This new constraint is similar to the Gaussian case. We only have a different safety margin C. In the Gaussian case, safety margin is uh, described as a CDF of the standard normal distribution. But here, safety margin is only based on the risk bound. So if we have a linear dynamics with arbitrary distribution, we can propagate the mean and the covariance in the same formula. And once we get the mean and the covariances, we can use this new linear constraints based on mean and the covariance. And if I plot these new constraints, we are going to get this larger obstacle for arbitrary distribution. Because in this case, uh, this linear constraint tries to take care of a huge family of the distributions. So this results in a larger safety margin compared to the Gaussian case. This is the easiest way of handling arbitrary distribution. I will get to this problem at the end and we will look at a completely different approach. So let's look at nonlinear system. So what is the easiest way to handle nonlinear system? You all know the answer. Yes, so we can linear, linearize it. But to do this, I need some kind of trajectory first so that we can linearize the dynamics around the trajectories. There is a set of tools, motion planning tools, that they can, in the offline mode, they construct the library of the different motions that we call the motion parameters, library of the different maneuvers. For example, here, these are the different maneuvers for a rover to go in different directions. Or for example, we have a library of the maneuvers for vehicle uh, for merging right and left with different velocities. By construct, we can construct these motion primitives by considering the nonlinear dynamics of the robot. By building this library in the online mode, we only need to find the right maneuver to execute, or we need to look at the right sequence of these maneuvers to get to the goal region. When we have an uncertainty, and instead of looking for optimal maneuver to execute, we can look for risk-bounded maneuver. So for this, we are given a library of the motion primitives. We can linearize the, the nonlinear dynamics around these trajectories using the Taylor expansion. So we are going to get a linear dynamics. So we know how to propagate the uncertainty. We need to propagate the mean and covariance. For example, these are the propagated uncertainties along the trajectory for the vehicle. This shows the sequence of the Gaussian distributions along each maneuver. Then we know that, so given this sequence of the distribution, we can use disjunctive constraints to calculate the risk, the risk of collision with obstacles, right? So for example, uh, yeah, we use this uh, disjunctive constraints given the linear obstacles to calculate the risk of each maneuver. For example, in this scenario, I have, we have two vehicles and I have uh, two set of maneuvers for keeping the lane and changing the lane for the blue car. This car at each time K calculates the risk of each maneuver and when the risk of Keeping the lane increases, it happens when it's, it gets close to the red vehicle. When the risk of that maneuver increases, it decides to change lane and execute a different maneuver. Okay. The next approach, uh, I call it risk-bounded control. And the main idea that we, we first assume that we have no uncertainties. We have a deterministic nonlinear system and we use the nonlinear trajectory optimization techniques that you saw on Tuesday. And we come up with a nominal trajectory for the plane. And then we want to design a controller to minimize these deviations because of the uncertainty. So here I don't have a chance constraint. I just want to minimize the risk of collision with obstacles. I want to minimize the risk of the execution of this given maneuver. Any closed loop controller will minimize this deviation. So uh, LQR controller is one of the popular closed loop controllers. So let's see how does it work under uncertainty. 
So we are given a traje nominal trajectory from by solving the nonlinear trajectory optimization. Then we are going to again linearize the nonlinear dynamics around the trajectory. So we are going to have a linear dynamics. In the deterministic case, LQR tries to minimize this given quadratic cost function. And in the stochastic case, it tries to minimize the expected value of the given cost function. Surprisingly, LQR offers us the same control input for both deterministic and stochastic case. It gives us this feedback that gain is obtained by solving the Ricard equations that comes from the dynamic program. So simply, LQR controller doesn't care about uncertainty, even if we ask for. This is terrible in some sense, but in other sense, it is good and makes life easier. This is called separation principle in control, meaning that we can separate the process of designing a controller for a linear dynamics and the proce process of designing a state estimator to deal with uncertainties. While we are designing a controller, we don't need to care about uncertainties. And while we are designing a state estimator to deal with uncertainty, we don't need to worry about the controller. We can design them separately and then mix them and get the LQG control. So in that sense, this is good. The main reason that LQR gives us the same control is that we are trying to minimize the expected value. So to avoid this, the other option is instead of minimizing the expected value, I'm going to minimize the, the covariance. So what does it mean? So because of the uncertainty, we saw that at each time k, we have states as a Gaussian distribution. So, uh, so we have a vector of a uh, Gaussian distribution. And I want to minimize the covariance of the joint Gaussian distribution of this random vector. So we are going to look at feedback controller to minimize the covariance with respect to some constraints on controller. In here, we can assume some, some kind of control actuation, but in the LQR case, we don't have any constraints on the control. LQR assumes that, assumes that we have unbounded control input. But here, we are allowed to consider constraints on the controller. Now, it is shown that this covariance, defined as here, is equal to the maximum eigenvalue of this matrix constructed by the parameters of the linear dynamics, unknown gains, and also exact matrix MI. So to minimize covariance, we need to minimize the maximum eigenvalue of this matrix with respect to this linear matrix inequalities. So it means that we need to look for some positive semi-definite matrix. It means that the all eigenvalues of this matrix should be positive. This problem is convex, and we can solve it efficiently by doing a eigenvalue decomposition. And we can solve them efficiently by uh, mosaic or sedumi solvers. These are LMI based or semi-definite pro programs. So by solving this convex problem, we can find a gain to minimize the covariance and see, let's see how it works. This is the propagated uncertainty under the regular feedback, PID. And this is the uncertainties under the covariance minimization. And it makes a lot of difference if you consider it with the PID. And for this scenario, we can avoid the obstacle by just minimizing the covariance. Or at least we can reduce the chance of collision. Uh, so I define the covariance in, the, in here. So if you consider that vector, vector of Gaussian random variables, the, it represents the, the states of the system. So then we are going to have one matrix <coughs> for covariance. We have a covariance matrix. So we want to minimize. So in other sense, we want to minimize the covariance of each of these. Uncertainties along the path. 
to minimize the deviation. And the, it is shown that to do this, you need to look at the eigenvalues of the shift constraint in terms of the parameters of the system. Okay, any other question? So in the previous approach, so I wanted to compare with the deterministic trajectory optimization. Deterministic trajectory optimization, we look for some open loop controller, okay? So that's why I was in the chance currency optimization, I was looking for some open loop nominal trajectory. But we can, but we can also look at the same time for some controller than the nominal. But in, in that case, we are going to see a nonlinear optimization we are no longer going to get a convex optimization. But other op the other option is that we design a controller, let's say we design an LQR controller offline, and then we plug that controller into the system. So we get a closed form system, and then look for the open loop nominal trajectories to minimize the risk. by choosing the, so if we get back. Yeah, just so the deterministic version of the trajectory optimization is stochastic. So we are looking for the sequence of the use. So if I want to consider controller, I can design a controller, and then in this case, the, the U would be KX states feedback plus the open loop controllers. I get the K from, let's say, LQR, and then look for the U stars by solving this optimization problem. Or we can look at the same time for the controller and the open loop, but then we will going to get a non-convex optimization problem. Okay, the last approach. So, so far, so you saw that the main idea was that first represent the, go the distribution with the mean and the covariance, and then replace the probabilistic constraint with linear disjunctive constraint in terms of the mean and the covariance of the distribution. But this time, I assume that we are given a nonlinear dynamics, arbitrary distribution, non-convex obstacles. I'm going to represent the distribution at each time with higher order statistics of the distribution where I call it moment. We are going to see the definition of the moment. And then I will re replace the chance constraint with linear matrix inequality in terms of the moment. So we know that what is LMI, you, we saw that in the previous approach, some linear matrix inequality. So first let's see what is moment. So for a given distribution, moment is, is described as this expected value. So the moment of order alpha is the expected value of the x to the power of alpha. So what is first order moment? Moment of order one, where alpha is one. Mean, yes. So, and similarly, the moment of order two is variance. So indeed, in the previous uh, approaches, I was using the first and second order moments to describe the distribution, but here I'm going to use a high order moments. I'm going to use first moments, second moments, third, and until to some fixed order moments. So I'm going to use this vector of moments, this mix, uh, vector of 
higher order statistics to parameterize, to represent the distribution. And then I'm going to find a new deterministic constraint on these moments to satisfy my chance constraints. We can retrieve all information of the probability distribution given the moment sequence. So let's see how moment and probability distributions are connected. Given a probability distribution, if we find the inverse Fourier transform, which is also called a characteristic function, and then if we find a Taylor expansion, we are going to observe the moment. Moments are coefficients of Taylor expansion of inverse Fourier transform of a probability distribution. This is how they are mathematically connected. But I'm not going to use these equations to solve my optimization. So, in summary, we are given a nonlinear dynamics. I don't want to linearize it. We are, uh, we are given arbitrary distribution. I don't want to find, assume that they are Gaussian. And we are given non-convex obstacles and non-convex goal region. I don't want to approximate them with the convex uh, regions. So the goal is to find a controller. Here, this controller could be both uh, open loop and a closed, uh, closed loop. I want to find this uh, controller to maximize the probability of success. The success here is defined as probability of remaining in the safe region at each time and also getting to the goal region. With respect to these uh, dynamical constraints. So my only assumption is that all functions are polynomials. I have a polynomial to describe my dynamics. I have a polynomial inequalities to describe my obstacles and also goal region. Then we need to solve this probability maximization in terms of the given probabilities. Now using the given dynamics, I can express the at each time xk in terms of the given control inputs and the initial states and uncertainties. By using this uh, description for xk, and if we plug them in inside my probability of a success, we are going to get the probability in terms of the uh, polynomials of the obstacles and polynomials of the dynamics. I want to clean this statement and come up with the new one. I represent the old polynomials with one polynomial PK, which comes from the polynomials of the uh, obstacles and the dynamics. I, and I define a, a new vector A, which is my, our decision vector, which is in terms of the control inputs. And I define uncertainty vector Q, which is a vector of all uncertainties, uncertain initial state and uncertain parameters. Then we can rewrite the, this uh, optimization in terms of this new definition. This is the standard way of representing probabilistic optimization. I'm looking for a control decision to maximize the probability of the success defined in terms of the uncertainty and decision variable. Now it can, we can show that to solve this problem, we need to solve this LMI in moment space. It looks ugly, but these are convex problems and we can solve them efficiently. Based on this problem, we need to look for two set of moments represented by Y and y, uh, A to satisfy this uh, linear matrix inequalities. The M matrix, it is called moment matrix, and LM is localized matrix. Moment matrix is defined uh, in terms of the moment, and it's a symmetric matrix. For example, it shows an example for a moment matrix of order four, where it used the moment up to <coughs> order four. Now, if this matrix is positive semi-definite, meaning that if the eigenvalues of this matrix is positive, we can claim that the given vector y are moment sequence of some probability distributions. Next, localizing matrix. Localizing matrix is defined in terms of the moment and given polynomial. Now, if this localizing matrix is positive semi-definite, we can claim that <coughs> the probability distribution of the moments y are defined on the region described by the given polynomial pk. 
So if this region describes our safe region, if we satisfy this, means that the probability distribution of the state are defined in the safe region. So this is how we can avoid the obstacles, by satisfying this linear matrix inequality. So in summary, these LMIs make sure make sure that we are looking for moment of sequence for probability distributions that are dynamically feasible and also defined in, and they are defined in the safe region so that we can avoid the obstacles. And now the main term is this, as we increase D, D is the number of the moments that I use to parameterize my probability distribution. And I use, as I use more moments to describe my uh, distribution, the cost function of the optimis my optimization will convert to the probability of the success, the probability of the original problem. And also the zero order moment of the second vector will convert to my controller. So this is exactly what we were looking for. So by increasing the D, we can get to the controller that works for nonlinear dynamics arbitrary distribution, non-convex region. And how many of you know about sums of squares technique? Okay, each optimization problem has a du dual problem. If we take the dual, we will see that we will get to the sums of squares problem. It turns out that looking for moments of probability distribution is equivalent of looking for some positive polynomials. So we can reformulate this problem as a sums of squares problem. There are many mathematical details behind this techniques. It requires functional analysis and uh, measure theories. To get more information and see how these problems are connected, sums of squares and these LMIs, and how we can improve the convergence rate for this problem, please look at my papers and if you have any questions, we can discuss more. Okay. Uh, it's only one thing. The main problem of this approach, this LMI-based approach, although these are convex problems, they can easily get intractable as the size of the original problem increases. So if the size of the original problem increases, we need to solve the LMI problem with larger matrices. So and it is so this is why it can get intractable. So, and to be able to handle large problems, we need to look for some kind of sparsity or structures in the matrices so that we can reduce them with some small metrics. So let's uh, wrap up. But before that, there are some uh, remaining points. Throughout this lecture, I assume that we are only given a state space model that describes my robot. We can also have observation model. When we are given an observation model that describes the behavior of the sensor, we only need to come up with the new equations to find the probability distribution of the states. To do that, we can use a Kalman or extended Kalman filter if we have access to observation. What do I mean by this? If we are at time k and I want to plan for a future finite horizon, I don't have access to my future observation. So future obser observation are random. In this case, we can use LQGMP approach that modi modifies the Kalman equations and find a, with the new way of calculating the uncertainties. Next, I assume that my states are continuous. We didn't look at discrete space. In discrete space, the problem is much, much easier. We have a discrete finite set of states, and instead of a continuous state model, we are given a state transition observation matrices. And by multiplying these matrices, we can find the discrete probability distributions of the state. And given these uh, discrete distribution, risk reduces to some sum with respect to the discrete distribution. So we don't have the problem of uncertainty propagation and the calculated integral over the non-convex region. To find the risk-bounded controller, 
we can actually look at the constraints from DPs. We can use uh, constant dynam dynamic programming or we can use heuristic tree search techniques. Okay. So in summary, we saw that we need responded planning techniques to, to first deal with uncertainty and next to get less conservative solutions. And we show that this problem is all about shaping the probability distributions of the state so that the overlap of the distribution with the obstacles becomes less than the risk bound. And to handle this, the main idea was that first replace the probabilistic constraints with deterministic linear constraints in terms of the mean and the covariance. And in the more general case, we, we first represented the distribution with higher order statistics and then replace the chance constraint in terms of some linear matrix inequalities. But before I finish my talk, I want to ask you a question. We all know about risk-bounded techniques for planning. So are you willing to take risk given this information? Risk in your research, work, or in your life? Let, let me give you a scenario. So assume that we are requesting a Lyft or Uber ride, and the app shows the risk of that ride. For example, it says that, OK, this ride has a risk of 0 0.01. This is the chance of failure for the ride. How many of you are willing to take this risk and accept the ride? How many yes answers? And how many no answers? Yes, this is the right answer. The right answer is not yes or no. The right answer is that how do I define the risk for this scenario? What is failure? If this failure means that, for example, the driver is drunk and we are going to have a fatal crash, my answer is no. And I don't care how many zero you put behind the one. I'm not going to take this risk. But if this failure means that, uh, OK, we are going to get five or 10 minutes late, then I can look at this number and decide. So before we use chance constraint techniques, we have to know what is definition of failure. We have to know what are the consequences of the failure. And we need to plan for that cases. So in this talk, I suggested to use chance constraints approach, but maybe the right solution is to first we use robust techniques to limit the, consequ the consequence of the failure, and then we use chance constraint techniques on top of it so that we can get more solid techniques. OK, any question? So at the beginning, so I said in, the robu in the robust techniques, we, are, we only look at the uncertainty state. scenarios we can actually more freedom using the DPs respond to techniques. Um, how do you shape the model that you're going to show in that video model? So the model we assume that we are given a state space model. So we have the model. But oh, for the model the uncertainty if you right. mean so by observe so in the So in this slide, OK. So we saw that by observing the uncertainty, if you look at the sample, you can use some kind of numerical techniques to find the, the distribution. We 
can't do a few seconds to find a probability distribution of the just uncertainty, not the state itself. So we need data and observation in general. I find the Taylor expansion up to order three and I break it. When, so if, if we construct the, the graph in belief space, we don't need to solve the expansion term. So when over breaks to a node, we know that its distribution is part of the time of the distribution that constructs that node. So this is the whole point of the external approach. We don't need to look at calculation at this time. We only need to do all calculations in upper node and then use the result in the real time. Any other question? Yeah, so in my techniques, I always assume that we are given some kind of probability for uncertainty. So I haven't looked at. But the, the main approach is, is still using the data. <coughs> you have to study observe. So, but in practice, uh, everyone uh, assumes that there is some kind of Gaussian distribution. OK.
father to let take risk and take responsibility. No one has to be saying, what if he fails? We should be ready for what comes after failure. We have a plan B, plan first attempt always. So your last name means brave, right? Right. <coughs> That's why you wrote it on this song here. Okay, I guess. Okay, good. So um, we're going to break for lunch tonight, and then um, at one o'clock, go back to the lab, and we'll give you the presentation. Okay. I really liked your talk. Thank I, you. Uh, I have some questions on. Uh, I think it'll be useful to look at the presentation. Ah, okay. Maybe we can.